Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Miguel Centeno. I'm a professor in sociology and the vice dean of the school. Uh, my role is a very deanly one. I'm going to introduce, not say anything, and leave, uh, which is pretty typical. Uh, but my apologies already for not being able to, to say uh, my, my clone is out for service, so he has to be someone. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon for a conversation on climate diplomacy with Sue Vinyas. Uh, Sue joined the Biden-Harris administration on day one as a deputy special envoy for climate change at the Department of State. Previously, she was a senior fellow at the Jackson, uh, Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and a senior fellow for climate change at the UN Foundation. For more than 25 years, Sue served as a lead climate lawyer for the U.S. State Department. In that capacity, she played a central role in all major international climate negotiations, including the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. During her tenure at State Department as Deputy Legal Advisor, she also supervised the Treaty Office in issues related to the Law of the Sea, Somali piracy, the Western Hemisphere, human rights, law enforcement, and private international law. She is joined in conversation today with Professor Denise Mazarol. Uh, Denise is a professor of environmental engineering and international affairs here at Princeton, and her research examines linkages between air pollution, origin, transport, and impacts, including impacts on human health, food security, and climate change. Thank you very much for Sue and Denise for joining us today, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. And, um... Thank you, Sue, for joining us. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to have this public conversation with Sue Binias about climate diplomacy. I first met Sue about 20 years ago, shortly after I arrived in Princeton. Another State Department official, Dan Schneider, who had been a lead negotiator for the U.S. On, on climate change and with whom Sue had worked for many years, was visiting Princeton for a year. He and I co-taught an environmental diplomacy workshop. He was the expert on negotiations, and I was sort of his science sidekick. Um, Sue was a highlight visitor for the workshop, explaining how the legal intricacies of negotiations and diplomacy worked on the international stage. We later brought the workshop to Bonn, Germany, for the fifth conference of the parties for the framework convention on climate change. And since then, all of us have continued to be involved from various angles in facilitating efforts to rapidly reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases to avoid catastrophic, catastrophic levels of climate change. Now approaching COP27, 22 years since we first met. It's been a long time, and um, I have a few questions for you um, that have been compiled partly by me and partly by students who've made uh, suggestions. And um, so first, given your 25 years of experience in climate negotiations for the United States, can you comment on how domestic politics and climate change have made international climate diplomacy challenging? And how has your impressions um, and perception of the U.S. evolved over this, this period? Okay, well, first, thanks um, for inviting me, and good to see you again after all these years. Um, <clears throat> well, I think, you know, the climate negotiations have been very challenging. Not only is it a uh, controversial topic internationally, but the point that you raise about dealing with an international issue when there isn't really domestic consensus on that issue has made it even uh, more challenging. So like the normal foreign policy issue, let's say at the State Department, is more in the control of the executive branch. Um, you know, the president has the authority to make lots of decisions about foreign policy, whether to recognize a foreign country or a foreign state uh, or something like that. But on climate change, the things that other countries are interested in getting out of the United States relate to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and funding or support for mm -hmm. uh, developing countries. And both of those have a congressional angle. Mm -hmm. So it's like walking a tightrope, right? Because you have to find that like sweet spot in between what is being demanded of you or sort of reasonably demanded of you internationally and what the traffic will bear domestically. And that has, from a lawyer's point of view, that has made this topic you know, particularly interesting, actually, uh, because you constantly have to find innovative ways of, um, you know, writing the international agreement so that it allows the United States to, you know, join, so it allows us to take on some kind of target. You know, we've never really had an economy-wide target in U.S. law, and yet we've had to take on economy-wide targets uh, internationally. So how do we do that? Well, you know, combination of things. We've, um, you know, the original treaty, 
made the targets non-legally binding. So we were able to join mm -hmm. the treaty and put in some kind of emissions target, but we didn't have to have, you know, strictly speaking, the law uh, to back it up. In other of these uh, international climate instruments, we've, not just us, but others have also wanted this, we've had sort of what we've called a bottom-up approach, which means that each state can figure out its own target, and that has allowed us to concoct some, you know, you know, offbeat kinds of targets where we've said, you know, when we were doing the Copenhagen Accord, we said that our reduction would be in the range of 17% because we had, you know, half a law, you know, it had passed the House, Waxman Markey, but mm -hmm. it had not passed the Senate. So we weren't sure, like, how is it going to come out? So we said, like, in the range of 17%. Uh, the Paris Agreement, you know, the Obama target was a 26 to 28% range because we weren't exactly sure what we could um, what we could aim for. So anyway, just, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of illustrate that the fact that we don't really have domestic consensus has, um, you know, has been frustrating, but it has also kind of uh, forced us to, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and all of that, come up with some innovative approaches. So in, in, in light of that, how do you feel about the Biden administration's um, international climate goals? Well, maybe I could go tick through the sort of top three international climate goals that the Biden administration came in with. Um, you know, after four years of the Trump administration where there was a you know, basic unwinding of both international and domestic climate policy, including withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, you know, the very first objective, I would say, was like to get the U.S. back on track or to get the U.S. Mm -hmm. House in order. I think of it that way. Um, and that consisted of rejoining the Paris Agreement. Uh, President Biden signed the instrument on day one of the yeah. administration, you know, like right after the inauguration. It's like great symbolism. Um, and also, if you're a party to the Paris Agreement, you have to have an emissions target on the books. And that's the so-called NDC, or Nationally Determined Contribution. So another thing that the U.S. had to do pretty quickly was get a target um, on the books, which it did in tall order in just a couple months. It got its, you know, target back into the Paris system. So that was, you know, getting the U.S. House in order. There are a couple other examples, but those are sort of key ones. So did it just ad adopt the Obama administration's NDC? No. What happened was the Obama administration had taken on a 2025 target. Most countries had taken on 2030 targets. Hmm. So it was basically decided, you know what, while we're at it, rejoining the Paris Agreement, why not just have a 2030 target like most of the other countries? And relative to a 2005 baseline? Both, yes. Keeping the 2005 baseline. So you basically went from 26, 28% to 50 to 52% uh, percent in the span of five years. So it was a pretty aggressive hmm. um, so jump. More ambitious. More ambitious, definitely. Um, so then the second objective was exercising U.S. climate leadership internationally. And, you know, a couple examples of that would be, you know, designating the first ever presidential envoy. So John Kerry was designated, you know, at a higher level than uh, the previous special envoy, which was also very, you know, symbolic. And a lot of other countries followed suit by designating sort of counterpart special envoys, uh, you know, at that, at that same level. So that had a good sort of catalyzing effect on other countries. Um, also, President Biden, during his campaign for president had basically said, I'm going to call a meeting of leaders, you know, the meaning heads of state and government on climate within the first 100 days. And so that was another thing when they came in, uh, basically decided, yeah, let's actually do that thing that we promised. Um, so that was a mad scramble. Um, and it ended up being held on Earth Day virtually because it was mm -hmm. still early, early COVID days. Um, so, you know, that was another example of, you know, very first leader level summit that the president calls is on climate change. So that, of course, was a sign of, um, of leadership. Um, okay, the other thing is the Biden administration reconvened as part of this leaders summit, something that had been started by George Bush. There's actually quite a bit of continuity on this one thing <laughs> on climate, um, which was a meeting of the major economies. Mm -hmm. A George Bush initiative was, hey, let's get the major economies of the world together. It's like 17 countries or so, including the EU, uh, that represent 80% of global 
emissions. And the idea even back then was if you get them together, maybe they can do something um, that's, you know, some kind of initiative that's easier than, you know, the 200 countries that are in the UN uh, process. And that was continued through the Obama administration, relabeled a little bit as the major economies forum. Mm -hmm. It kind of was fell asleep during the Trump administration, and then it was revived again during the um, Biden administration. And that has met several times over the last year. So that's, you know, just something to know about. And then maybe my, just my third point in terms of international um, climate goals was to raise global climate ambition. You know, there's a lot of overlap among these three, right? Like the more the United States does to get its house back in order, probably the easier it is to get other countries to do more. You know, exercise and climate leadership, the purpose of it is to raise climate emissions. So, you know, these are not like unrelated to each other. Mm -hmm. But the third one was, the whole point was the new administration came in and said, those Paris temperature goals, which if you're familiar with the Paris Agreement, it's basically to make sure that warming doesn't exceed uh, well below two degree Celsius um, increase, you know, global increase average beyond pre-industrial levels. And a, a little you know, tagline in the Paris Agreement says, while pursuing a limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Right? And this administration came in basically saying, you know what, we really need to lean into 1.5. E even since Paris in those couple of years, since 2015, there had already been an IPCC report saying, you know, the difference between two and 1.5 is very dramatic. Uh, even at 1.5, there are going to be significant impacts. So the new administration came in and said, like, you know, one of our major goals for this year is to try to limit or, or at least get on track much more to limit warming to 1.5. So a lot of the effort that took place in 2021 was to work with the major economies, both together and separately, to try to get them to increase their uh, their targets or increase their ambition. So can you, can you describe a bit about the actual negotiating process to make what you describe come to pass? Um, yeah, it's, a, you know, it's kind of a complicated process because, you know, if you only go to an annual conference of the party or, you know, like the COP that happened in Glasgow last year, you're probably maybe not aware of all the things that happened before mm -hmm. the COP. So it do, you don't just get to the COP and it's like, oh, we reached agreement. Lots of other processes take place during the year on the road to uh, the COP. So one of them would be whoever is the president of the COP and it changes every year, it goes <laughs> from region to region. So let's say the UK last year was the president of the COP in Glasgow, they would hold several meetings during the course of the year on different topics and at different levels. Some would be at more like at the negotiated level, some would be at the uh, so-called ministerial mm -hmm. level, right? So that would be one you know, set of sort of pre-meetings. Then you would have the, the negotiating groups would get together during the year, like hammer out their own positions and try to get on the same page, right? Like the small island states have their own grouping. The US is in this grouping called the umbrella group, which is like, basically the developed countries minus the, the EU. You have regional groups like the Africa group or the, uh, the Arab group. Um, so those are all meeting and trying to get their act together. Then you have like meetings of countries that call themselves you know, more progressive, would be getting together and trying to figure out like what's the progressive outcome that we're, um, mm -hmm. we're looking for. You would have think tanks calling meetings during the year of key countries and trying to play a kind of facilitative role uh, of countries of you know maybe 30 or so of all stripes to try to like lay the groundwork or we used to call it like to get some of the um, ultimate outcomes into the bloodstream you know you might not actually be agreeing to them but you'd sort of be you know testing the waters on them and people would start you know coalescing around hmm this, that seems like it might actually um, Work. So all of those things are going on. And of course, you had uh, last year was an unusual year because there were no in-person negotiations mm -hmm. until you got to the cops. It was like particularly challenging. A lot of the things had been done virtually. A lot of countries said, we can't negotiate virtually. So there were like negotiations that were not called negotiations. Mm -hmm. They were called like something else. I forget what. Um, faux negotiations. And then so by the time they got to the cop, you weren't starting from scratch, right? So that's just one important thing to know. Then when you got to the COP, again, these different levels would be taking place. So there would be negotiator 
uh, more technical um, talks going on, like oh, in room, whatever, and split up by topic. You know, a lot of the Paris guidelines had not yet been finished, so you might have like Article 6 guidelines over here, Article 13 guidelines over there. Then you would have the maybe higher level group of heads of delegation, so the top negotiators um, meeting, you know, in a different room. And then you would have the ministers, you know, the ministerial meetings, generally not taking up the, you know, the underbrush, but taking up the sort of key issues that the uh, negotiators were not able to resolve. So those are the different levels, and then you would have different um, permutations of openness, I suppose, mm -hmm. in addition to the different levels of um, you know, hierarchy, I guess. Um, so you, you know, some meetings would take place in a big room like this, probably much bigger than this, where all 200 countries would be sitting there and it'd be very open. And sometimes you could actually resolve something in a big room like this. You know, there might be an impasse, but somebody might say, what about this word? And everybody might be quiet, and the chair might say, Hearing no objection, you know, boom, we've agreed. So that might be totally out, out in the open, and the observers would be watching, and you know, all of that. Other issues might not get resolved till some, you know, back, back door, back room, um, you know, consultation among a couple countries. In Glasgow, that was the case on some of the language about maybe you read about coal phase down versus coal phase mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a last minute. China and India objected to phase down, the US joined the little huddle with the UK as the chair, as the host, and you know, we went to the back and sort of figured something out and then you know, came out. So you know, I think all of those things uh, are present at every COP, you know, pretty much, but it's hard to predict in advance like, which is the thing that's gonna get resolved here versus you know, in the background. So that's really interesting. So I've been in rooms where those large rooms you're describing where they have the words up on a huge screen and there's hands that are going up from different countries saying, I want to change those three words. Mm -hmm. And then there's an agreement or not, as you described. But is it the case like with a coal phase down or phase out that was discussed in the back rooms that they came back into the main room and is everything finalized in the main room where the wordsmithing occurs? Everything has to be adopted by the plenary at the end, right? Mm, so okay. like that back room deal was subject to the rest of the, mm. you know, party saying, okay. And they didn't, you know, the UK didn't just come out from the back and say, okay, here it is. I mean, he made sure to like walk around to the different groups and basically explain, here's what happened in the back and make sure that mm. like everybody was okay with it. Because of the consensus process and, you know, consensus meaning absence of a formal objection. Mm. So any one country can say, you know, I object. And then there is no consensus, you want to be really sure if you're the, the president or the chair that like nobody's going to do that. Right, because then you're sort of... Yeah, because then you got to, you know, then, then you run the risk that the whole thing just sort of like falls apart. Right. Yeah. Definitely to be avoided. Interesting. Um, so China's the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world and the U.S. is second. Cooperation between the two countries is really vital. Can you talk a bit about the U.S.-China engagement on climate? Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, at this point, the U.S. is closer to about 10% of GHGs and China about 30%, right? So together, they're like 40% of global emissions. And, you know, you don't keep 1.5 alive without more action from, from China. Um, we sort of have a long history of cooperating or engaging with China on climate back to the Obama administration. And it was actually Secretary Kerry as Secretary of State when he came in, he was like already interested in, in climate and knew that we had to do something big with mm -hmm. China when he came in. And so, you know, we were sort of told in our, in our little, you know, team climate, like we got to go do some, go big with, uh, with China. So in 2014, we actually did the so-called joint announcement at the mm -hmm. leader level. And it was, it was, you know, really a catalyzing instrument um, for the Paris Agreement. It took place about a year before Paris and the two countries, you know, already out in the ether or in the bloodstream, I guess, of the process was that the Paris Agreement was going to be based on nationally determined contributions. And, you know, about two years before Paris, you already had a decision of the party saying, hey, everybody, every country is invited to put forward its uh, nationally determined contribution, you know, well before Paris. Right? So the US and China decided, hey, let's put ours out 
really, really well before Paris, meaning a year and a month. So, and it was total surprise. We managed to keep this thing, um, you know, from anybody else so that when it landed, it was yes. a huge shock to the system. Like what? These two countries that have, you know, kind of historically been at odds on many things, but including climate change, were able to get together at the presidential level, announce their nationally determined uh, contributions and some other rhetoric uh, in that joint announcement and had a, like a really great effect on the rest of the world because a lot of the world, I think, may, they might, if you were skeptical that there was going to be a Paris Agreement, I think this would have maybe signaled uh, there is going to be a Paris Agreement. It was, it was huge news and yeah. very catalyzing, I think. Exactly. And, you know, by the time we got to Paris, it hadn't even started yet. There were something like 185 of these NDCs on the table. I mean, that's how catalyzing uh, it was. So that was then. Fast forward, you know, past the Trump administration to the Biden administration. The idea was, hey, you know, it's not 2014 again. Of course, things are different, but let's see if we can do something, uh, engage with uh, China. Again, it's even more dire in a way. Now we have the Paris Agreement, but China's emissions are going up and up. And so really important to engage with them. So that a lot of what we did last year was uh, bilateral sort of um, discussions, mostly virtual, but with two mm -hmm. trips uh, under COVID conditions. So very sort of stressful and unusual. Um, and then we got together before Glasgow in mm -hmm. London to try to keep up the um, negotiations and see if we could come up with something you know, we could, that we could announce bilaterally. And you know, we didn't plan to announce it during Glasgow necessarily, but it just kind of landed in the middle of Glasgow and it you know, had, a, had a good effect because it was right in the middle. It was in the middle of a, like, a bit of a lull in the negotiations, so it looked like, oh wow, this is, you know, this is actually, it added some, um, some oomph um, Do you to want to Glasgow. Tell us what exactly that was? Yeah, and so that was the, we call this the joint, you know, Glasgow Joint, joint Declaration. It's not a legally binding instrument or anything, but it was a, more like a political document and it had um, three main commitments from China, which we are now pursuing, you know, bilaterally. Uh, but one involved methane, you know, it's one of um, the powerful greenhouse gases that China has not yet included in its mm -hmm. NDC um, and has not regulated, much less put in its NDC. So the United States already has a methane strategy out there. So we sort of said, you know, the U.S. has put out a methane strategy. China will put out its national action plan on methane in 2022. Mm. So that was, you know, one piece. Another piece related more to coal and CO2. Uh, it acknowledged that China is in its 15th five-year plan starting in 2026 uh, to 2031. is supposed to start its phase down of coal consumption. And this piece says that they're going to make best efforts to accelerate the coal phase mm. down. And then the third has to do with deforest, you know, stopping deforestation. And both the United States and China have laws that are that prohibit the import of illegally harvested wood. The U.S. has been in place for a long time. China's is new and hasn't been implemented yet. So the idea was that we would, you know, cooperate to on the effective enforcement of uh, of these laws. So those are the three key pieces, and then basically setting up the machinery to get that cooperation going. Yeah, that's very valuable. Um, can you tell us a bit about what the U.S. objectives at COP26 were in Glasgow this past November, and do you think they were accomplished? Yeah, I, I seem to keep, you know, mentioning things in threes, but okay. <laughs> Here's another one that sort of comes out, comes out with three. Um, well, the first is the temperature, you know, the temperature goal of 1.5, right? So the Biden administration, like, like many other countries, more and more convinced that we need to lean into 1.5. So like key objective for Glasgow was uh, to try to get, I guess you could say, like significantly closer to being on track to 1.5. I mean, nobody really thought we would absolutely be on track to 1.5. It was impossible. Um, but more on track or much more on track or, you know, however you want to phrase it. Uh, so that's what a lot of the work in 2021 was about, was going to, well, at the time, to Russia, to China, to Saudi Arabia, to India. You know, a lot of the major emitters in this 
major economies forum and trying to get them to strengthen their NDCs under the Paris Agreement and take on net zero goals for mm -hmm. mid-century and basically other, you know, whatever other action would help keep uh, 1.5, we used to say within reach or alive or in sight or however you want to phrase it. Mm -hmm. So that was number one. And I would say that that came out well. It wasn't just a U.S. thing. A lot of other countries were, you know, pushing the same uh, objective and in the UK certainly as the president and I think you know everyone would tell you that like we are closer now to 1.5 than we were you know a year ago. The second was to get a, some kind of strong signal out of Glasgow about how Glasgow is not the end of the of the story. You know there was some worry before Glasgow that you know whatever didn't happen there okay whatever <laughs> you're off the hook you know um, we got what we got, that's it. No, a lot of countries, including ours, wanted to make, get some kind of decision out of the parties in Glasgow that made clear that like, you know, this is a decisive decade or a critical decade, that kind of rhetoric. It's uh, gonna be crucial to accelerate emission reductions during this decade. And that, you know, if you didn't already, um, you know, enhance your NDC and take on a net zero goal and all of that, like you, you still need to, we haven't forgotten, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And that was a challenging objective because again, this consensus process, like could you actually get everyone in the world to agree to strong language? And the answer was, you know, yes, you could. So I think it's a pretty, this so-called Glasgow Climate Pact, I think is, is stronger than most people imagined um, it would be. And then the third piece, I guess, for, the, for COP26 was to finish this Paris rule book and you know there uh, the issue is um if you read the paris agreement from 2015 you'll see many places where it says the parties will adopt guidelines to implement this uh this article uh, you know at the, for the first time they meet the second time they meet whatever so there are many places in the paris agreement where you sort of like kick the can down the road either because you were it wasn't so urgent to reach agreement on those rules or guidelines, or uh, they were very technical and long, and you didn't want to, um, you know, waste pages and pages or lots of negotiating effort on finishing those things. So a lot of it was like put off, and that was called the rule book. And most mm -hmm. of that was done at the COP in Poland a couple of years ago, but not all of it was done. And then you lost a year because of COVID, and then mm -hmm. when there was no COP. So like six years after Paris was a little embarrassing, right? Like we still haven't finished the rule book. That's, you know, six years is practically, is like longer than it took to negotiate the Paris <laughs> Agreement. So that's a little strange. So, you know, another top priority was like, you know, we just got to get the, the rules done to sort of fully operationalize the agreement. And, you know, we, when I say we, I mean the collective we did get that done. So I think on all three of those, it, um, you know, it was, it was pretty successful. Well, that's great. Do you um, see countries developing NDCs that will meet that one and a half degree target? And are they now all of them including, or most countries including the other greenhouse gases in addition to CO2? Okay, so let me try to remember both of these questions. Um, one is on NDCs. And so many countries strengthened their NDCs on the road to Glasgow, but not all. And there's hope that they'll do them in the next COP. And I so think, right? one of the provisions in the Glasgow Climate Pact speaks exactly to that point, paragraph 29, if anyone's interested in looking, uh, which basically says you're urged to revisit and strengthen your 2030 NDC target if it isn't already aligned with the Paris temperature goal, okay? And to mm. do so in 2022, okay? So it's definitely aimed mm. at the countries that didn't already align themselves. Align is a word we use all the time, overuse, but that's like mm. the new whatever, aligning with Paris or Paris align is like, if you wanna sound really with it, you, you say that. Um, so that provision is pretty critical, and there'll be a lot of focus on that provision mm. this year. Like, will it be successful? Who knows? But that's something mm -hmm. we and many others are working on to get the, you know, the NDCs that are not yet sort of 1.5 consistent to be uh, improved.
On your other question, which was about you know methane or non CO two non CO two gases. Right. So when we got to Paris, all the developed countries already had economy wide targets covering all sectors and all gases. And we've basically been treating greenhouse gases as a basket since the very beginning. You go back to the 1992 framework convention, there's a basket of like six gases or so that are covered. If you look at the Kyoto Protocol, same thing. Um, it's always been a basket of gases approach, not a CO2 only approach. And all of the developed countries and some developing countries have economy-wide targets, but many don't. And China's like made the like a perfect example of a country that has only put CO2 into mm -hmm. its NDC. And it's the it's accounts for 30% of global emissions. So a lot of you know countries would say, where are the other greenhouse gases you should be, including them, particularly methane. So that's why one of the reasons it was important to us in this joint declaration that we did in Glasgow to say, you know, mm -hmm. national action plan on methane. Hopefully that will also you know, make its way into the NDC. Why is that important? First of all, NDCs are the currency of the Paris Agreement. And second mm -hmm. of all, if something's not in your NDC, it's not covered by the like accountability provisions, you know, of the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement has these, like we call it the transparency regime, and it calls for you to report on how you're doing, what your emissions are, to track progress toward the achievement of your, uh, of your NDC. And you know, if you have some thing domestically, like a national action plan, but it hasn't been shoved into your NDC, you're, you're, it's not going to be subject to any of that uh, transparency process. So that's another reason to, to get it in there. So along, along those lines, um, actually redu making real reductions requires people to, stakeholders to do something real on the ground. And so in these negotiations, how important are these stakeholders like fossil fuel companies or renewable companies or end user commitments like from high tech firms or investment banks or environmental groups? Because you see them in the satellites around the um, COPs, but do they influence the negotiations or the outcomes in substantial ways? Yeah, they definitely do. Um, and they have many pathways. They not only influence, in the olden days I would have said that is their role is to influence, but now they have a, com a completely different role also in addition to influence, which is like to taking on commitments of their, mm -hmm. of their own. So that, and that was kind of a new thing. Uh, a, a, in a way, the Paris Agreement sort of broke some new ground in that regard, right? Because some had been pushing for the Paris Agreement to like literally allow subnational governments like you know cities and states and regions and companies to join okay that wasn't going to happen mm. you know that would that would be like breaking the back of the paris there, there was enough to negotiate much less like changing uh, <laughs> hundreds of years of practice okay but um, there were a lot of innovations sort of surrounding the paris agreement um, first of all there was a portal that was established a couple of years before paris that allowed subnational uh, governments and companies to take on commitments, and it was pretty cool. You could like click on a region, a state, a province, anywhere in the world, and see what they had taken on, or a company. And you know, it's it's changed its names over, over the year, its name. So I can't tell you what its name is uh, right now, but it's interesting and it's worth looking at. Um, they also tried to figure out ways uh, for the Paris Agreement process to like continue engagement with these, what they called non-party stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So that could be a subnational government or it could mm -hmm. be a company or an NGO or, or whatever. So that's become like an elaborate part of the process. There are these every year two champion, climate champions, which are kind of designated by the uh, current and future president of the COP. And they come up with a big plan for engaging with outside groups and driving you know, emission reductions. Uh, so a bottom-up bottom, bottom up approach to complement yeah. the top-down approach. And yeah, so yeah. Who, who are they? This, well, so this last year, you know, so there was a UK uh, climate champion plus a Chilean one from the COP before. Mm -hmm. And now there's a, the UK, same UK one and now a new Egyptian one was just named a couple days ago because the COP this year is going to be in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. And so those champions, you know, last year they 
sort of ran this campaign called Race to Zero, where they tried to get companies to take on, um, you know, net zero commitments. Um, and they also have a, like a race to resilience to deal with adaptation, not just um, mitigation. So that's become like a major sort of piece of the Paris machinery. Um, so it's a, it's a very good question. And I thought I would just add that, like that's sort of the international piece, but at home, um, subnational governments and companies also took on a huge role, ironically, <laughs> right after the Trump administration announced that we were gonna withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, like probably 24 hours after that June 1st, 2017 announcement, you had two organizations spring up, one just of US states called the US Climate Alliance, mm -hmm. um, which basically held to commit, you know, the commitments of the Paris Agreement to the temperature goal and to the Obama target, at least within those states, uh, started out with three. And I think now they're like 25 of the 50 US states are uh, members of this alliance. And then there was a broader alliance, not just of subnational, uh, not just of states, but of cities, states, you know, faith based groups, companies, universities. I don't know if Princeton joined, but a lot of universities joined. Um, and it was called We Are Still In. And the whole point was like, well, the federal government may be out, but like we are still in for our part. Um, yeah. Now, you know, one of the interesting issues was like what would happen to those groups if a Democratic president got elected? Would they just sort of like fade away because they were just like the interim substitute for a functioning federal government on climate, or would they keep going? And you know, the U.S. Climate Alliance is still alive and well, and I think you know it's in, now subnational governments are like doing things in their own right, mm -hmm. not just as a you know as a sub uh, for the federal government. And the We Are Still In Coalition, I think they they renamed themselves. You know, America is still in, um, but mm -hmm. they're still alive and and well. And you know, they function all year, but they also come to the COP. And during the Trump years, it was like very effective to have them coming to the COP because it as a diplomatic matter, it basically showed to other countries like that the US was not a monolith mm -hmm. on climate, that whereas you know the federal government was against Paris and climate action, the United States as a whole was not. Um, so you know they performed kind of indirectly that kind of function. Mm -hmm. Keeping us somewhat credible still. Yeah, yeah exactly. International arena. And what about the private sector, like General Motors committing to sell only electric vehicles by 2035? Is that something that influences negotiations, this kind of private sector commitment saying this is possible, we can mitigate? Yeah, um, that... no, absolutely. It, uh, first of all, increases the credibility of national governmental Close. targets mm -hmm. when, you see, when you hear all these commitments from uh, the private sector, but then the private sector sometimes have, have their own, you know, uh, groups of commitments, uh, right. um, so which you know were highly influential uh, throughout last year and at the COP26, when people took a, you know sort of tried to take account of how close are we to 1.5, they would take account of all of the mm -hmm. types of commitments, not just the ones of of governments. So they get factored in. Of course, you always have people saying like, well, but what what is the accountability of a of a company, we need to do a better job of, you know, follow through and, you know, making sure that companies actually do what they say they're going to do. And some are concerned about like greenwashing and blah blah blah. But you know, yeah. compared to not having those commitments, it's probably, you know, better. Better. Yeah, yeah. I agree. So, um, sort of in conclusion, can you tell us what the goals are for COP twenty seven that'll occur in Egypt this November? And are you optimistic or? pessimistic that countries will meet their current NDCs and strengthen them going forward adequately to meet this 1.5 or 2 degree target? Um, well, let me try the first question first. So COP27, I think, is going to be like a new kind of COP. Um, and it'll be interesting for like students to, to think about um, in terms of regime, you know, international environmental regimes. Because, um, you know, until now, every COP has really had some kind of major negotiations purpose. Mm -hmm. Either uh, something was due to be done, um, or it was on the road to the thing mm. <laughs> that was supposed to be done. So, you know, sometimes it would be like the mandate for the Kyoto Protocol, and then there would be like two years where you were negotiating 
Kyoto Protocol, and everybody would be focused on, did they make progress at that COP? And then the, at the next one, you know, did they reach agreement on the Kyoto Protocol? And then you would you know, switch to the next thing, or the rules under the Kyoto Protocol took you know, several years. Um, so there's always been some major thing to be negotiated that people could use to measure, like that was the metric for uh, judging whether a COP was successful or not successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that that was always like the right measure, but it was at least something you could grab onto. The way the Paris Agreement is organized or structured, countries are putting in their own nationally determined contributions. They're not negotiating those targets. So we don't have a system where like every four years or five years, there's another negotiation of the targets. No, every five years, countries are just throwing in their targets. So the thing to be, the things to be, and now that we've finished this rule book, so-called, you know, the rules and guidelines under the Paris Agreement, there's not much left to negotiate. There are some things, but they're rather minor in the scheme of things. Not that they're not important, but they don't, like, they don't rise to the level of uh, like a new agreement or you know, a rule book or anything like that. So, like, so how then do you judge a COP? Well, I think people have to be creative in figuring out like, what is the purpose of the COP now? I mean, could right? the purpose of the COP be for the countries of the world to commit to accelerating mitigation enough to meet these two degree or 1.5 degree targets and we can judge it based on whether those commitments are forthcoming or not? Yeah, absolutely. Countries can do a million different things. They could just decide, and it might not be 200 of them, but like critical mass could decide, here's what we're going to try to deliver by COP27. Mm -hmm. Or, or and or, there were a bunch of initiatives um, last year that the UK spearheaded, and so did the United States and others. And, you know, one important thing is like not to forget from year to year about everything that happened the year before. <laughs> so it was even proposed on a meeting the other day that I was attending virtually that like a whole day of the COP be devoted to, okay, what did, what did everybody do this past year to Im implement the mm -hmm. initiatives that they signed on to last year on, you know, getting away from coal or deforestation or zero emission vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm sure Egypt is going to have some new initiatives to mm -hmm. add you know, and to throw into the hopper. Like one of the things that we spearheaded with the EU at COP26 was called the Global Methane mm -hmm. Pledge, yeah. right? So in addition to this bilateral thing with China, we pushed the idea that uh, countries should sign on to a global goal of reducing um, emissions by 30% below 2020 levels by 2030. And about 110 countries signed up for that. Um, by the time of the end of the end of COP26, so we're going to hold a sort of follow-up mm. meeting at Sharm El Sheikh, uh, a, you know, a ministerial on uh, the Global Methane Pledge to on implementation. So, what has everybody done? Yeah, Does everybody now have an, a national action plan? There's a pot of money that the philanthropies have thrown uh, out mm. there of like 340 million dollars, which is substantial uh, for developing countries. And, you know, that would be another thing, a sign of like something as part of the success, you know, that one could um, look at in judging mm. the cop. Um, but anyway, I think it's like there's room for creative thinking in terms of like what these cops should now do. I think the, like the things that are going on, the out, on, on the outside of a cop unofficially have become somewhat more interesting. I know this is an admission against my own interest since I'm now on the inside, but now, now <laughs> I'm finding the outside slightly more interesting than the inside, right? Because a lot of the inside is the sort of tedious negotiation of, mm -hmm. you know, points that are like not that fascinating. <laughs> and outside is where all the action is and a lot of the interesting issues are being, you know, Fomented. handled in yeah. like side events and panels and workshops and all that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Well, we'll see. So um, we have time for some questions from all of you. I think the protocol is, if you can take one of these microphones, you can come down and ask it into the microphone, and then it will be included in the live stream. So if you wanted to come down, um, and if there's anyone who wants to ask, you can do the same with the microphone here. We'll take turns. I think we have at least 15 minutes for this. And um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then go ahead and ask your question. 
What's that? Is it like working or is it just I am not sure. I'm assuming it's working, but on. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, and it's a it's a pleasure and an honor um, to hear you and to learn so much. Um, my name is Ronit Sela. I was I graduated as an MPP from the school. Um, I'm from Israel. I happened to be in Princeton for two days. <laughs> um, so good timing. Um, one criticism that I've heard a lot, and I'm wondering what you would say about it, is that the 1.5 or the two percent or the two um, limitation was something brought on by the politicians, whereas the scientists kept talking about PPM, about parts per million and 350, um, and that choosing to go with the degrees rather than the PPM um, derailed possibly, that would be the criticism, some of the achievements or kind of a goal setting for the countries. Um, and I just would be happy to hear your comments on that. Um, I don't really know about that. I mean, that could be true. I, I, I'm not aware of that, which is not to say that that's not the backstory. <laughs> you know, in, in my recollection, if you go back to the 1992 framework convention, you know, there was no number in there at all, either PPM or temperature. It was just avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate, with the climate system. system. And for a long time, there was no quantification whatsoever. And then, like, one day, as I recall, in 2009, scientists started saying two degrees, two degrees, two degrees, um, you know, that we should not be going beyond two degrees. And so that became kind of the mantra. And I don't know if behind that was some other, <laughs> you know, other forces were at work saying, no, that's not the right approach. But in my recollection or experience, you know, it was sort of like this very incremental uh, development down to 1.5. First, it started at like what was interesting in 2009 at one of our major economies meetings. There was no policy agreement on two degrees. They, but the sentence says these countries recognize the scientific consensus, something like that. They recognize as a fact that scientists have said mm -hmm that two degrees is the important thing. So, um, and then a couple months later in, in Copenhagen, it went to below two degrees, and a couple pages later there was a reference to, we should also think about 1.5. Then a couple years later it was like, uh, well, in Paris, well below two while pursuing 1.5. So, I mean, to me, that, like, that was the history of this uh, quantification of you know, dangerousness. But I don't know if there was some, like, in an alternative universe, whether it should have been something else. Well, I, I think actually what may be going on there is that the, cl the climate scientists are concerned about the temperature change. But you need to go from the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to the temperature using climate models, which are complicated. So it's, you could peg something to a concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but really what you care about is the damage. So then we use these models to make that conversion. And I think... Um, what you say is consistent with my understanding. We've always focused in terms of the negotiations on the damages. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, hi, my name is Baljit Chima. Firstly, thank you both for a really uh, interesting discussion. Um, so I'm an MPP, current MPP. I was on Prof Moserol's climate change um, course last semester. Um, and opened my eyes to a lot. I'm actually I'm from a me medical background, so it's a very different world. Um, the question I would have is partly reflecting on I'm currently very far from the world of medicine in the weapons of mass destruction uh, course uh, and international security. And we've just been, this last week, um, looking at the New START Treaty um, and how that was negotiated and all the ins and outs of that. And one of the elements... Um, that's been interesting in different treaties we've looked at is the compliance regime and the monitoring um, body or uh, agreements around monitoring. And um, again, apologies for uh, I'm not uh, uh, totally familiar with if there are any in in um, the Paris Agreement. And when you mentioned now that, for example, going forwards, countries would be presenting their 
uh, national action plans and uh, NDCs and progress with them. Is there going to be any checking on that? I mean, otherwise people can just, you know, greenwash stuff and present it the way they'd like to. Um, do you think that if there isn't currently any major um, action in that direction, is that something that might come in in due course? Um, well, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, you know, the... Environmental treaties in general, and Paris, you know, even more so, they don't have anything akin to like an arms control agreement where countries actually are willing to, you know, trust but verify and have like on site inspection or anything like that. No, there's no way that most countries in the world would agree to have, you know, an inspector come to check on your CO2 emissions. Plus, how would you even do that, right? Because you, you know, it's, it's not like going and checking some uh, on, some uh, you know discrete sites where there might might be weapons, right? How, like how would you check uh, CO two emissions in an entire country? Um, so it's you know it's more uh, dependent on reporting and review, and there's like a technical review of the emissions, um, you know, sector by sector, gas by gas, and then the sort of like technical and policy review of the extent to which you're on track to meet your target. Could a country put in false information? I suppose tech, the technical bodies can, or the technical review teams can generally sort of figure out if things don't make sense and compare them to other things. You know, the International Energy Agency has a lot of data that can be sort of cross-checked and, you know, NGOs and think tanks will also, you know, usually scream if a country is has reported something that is, you know, does not accord with what they think is is correct. Now, one thing that might change the world is you now have satellite monitoring coming online and a bunch of different um, initiatives to start monitoring. I'm not sure you can do that for all greenhouse gases, but I think for some greenhouse gases. So we may enter a world at some point where, you know, these written submissions are like overtaken by <laughs> real world monitoring and there's like nowhere to hide. And so that would be the thing that's probably more likely to change than getting countries to agree to be inspected. Hi, um, I'm Sophia. I'm a grad student in atmospheric and oceanic sciences. And I was just wondering if you think there might be under the UNFCCC or another institution some framework for regulating geoengineering in the next mm. few years. Yeah. Hi, Sophia. I thought that was you. <laughs> she was in my class. Um, the um, well, it's a it's a great question. It's something that I um, work on myself and I've written about before I came back to the uh, to the government. I really probably don't think so. Um, I think countries are interested in the topic, some from a uh, defensive point of view because they're worried about various geoengineering options. First of all, geoengineering is like a very broad term. Some people mean carbon dioxide removal. Other people just mean, you know, um, putting particles in the stratosphere exactly. to reflect incoming solar radiation. Yeah, solar radiation management. Um, but, you know, if you want to call it geoengineering, um, so some are worried about it from a defensive point of view and would probably want some rule that says like nobody should be doing any research, nobody should be doing any deployment unless like the entire world agrees. Other countries are not gonna to agree to that if either they wanna keep their options open <laughs> or I can imagine some countries that are uh, you know, vulnerable to climate change might also wanna keep open the option of geoengineering, right? Because if you think we're not on track to 1.5, and if you think we need more to buy more time, like you might want to keep the option open of, you know, some stratospheric aerosol injection of like some whatever to buy five years or something like that. So I don't think it would be easy to reach agreement on like the governance of whether this should take place or not. But maybe there would be something, I can imagine some kind of informal arrangement on transparency, right? Where countries agree to like let each other know about the research that they're doing. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe that would lead to something else, but I can imagine that maybe in the first instance. Thanks. Any further questions?
Hi, uh, my name is Leah Hazard. I'm an MPP. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, you mentioned some of the commitments that have been made by the private sector. You mentioned some of the philanthropic funds. Um, and I'm curious when you say, you know, that what's happening on the outside is the most interesting uh, beyond the negotiations. Like, what are those most interesting things that are happening, the most compelling things in, you know, climate change mitigation right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I was really referring to the fact that when you go to a COP, I guess I went to maybe four COPs on the outside world. Every other COP I've been to has been on the inside world. Um, and when you're in the inside world, you have no time to see anything in the outside world. So like mm -hmm. basically to you, the outside, you know, everything not associated with the negotiations is just like something you have to walk through mm. to, to get to the negotiation. But when you're in the outside, you realize like, oh my God, there's so many interesting things because there are booths set up by outside organizations um, showing like all the kinds of things that they're either committing to or researching or whatever. And then the panels are also really interesting. And a lot of the, uh, like Sophia mentions geoengineering, the parties never talk about geoengineering, but there have been side events on geoengineering, right? So, you know, somehow it's like, okay, and, and on sea level rise and implications of sea level rise. If you go to the COP, you can actually learn a lot from the side events, but if you actually tried to get a so-called agenda item agreed within like my world on one of those topics, like you would fail, right? So that's what I mean by, mm -hmm. there's a lot of actually like really interesting stuff going on um, at the COP that has nothing to do with the like official negotiated outcomes mm -hmm. process. And in a way that's, you know, it's enables you to learn more than you would learn just by <laughs> working on these sometimes minute issues that we have to work on. But that means it's educational. It doesn't actually have an impact on the negotiated outcomes. Well, sometimes it does. I mean, to the extent that negotiators like have time, which in an ideal world they would, to go to some of these uh, outside events, it actually is having an effect. And even where they're not, where, you, where they don't have time to go to these outside events, the people who are, you know, purveying these interesting ideas or whatever will often try to meet with um, delegates from countries and you know uh, to me the cops are most successful when uh, all of these people are in the same place you know sometimes at the cops and it depends on the country and the uh, architecture of the buildings you know these inside world and outside world are are very far apart or like a mile apart or you know which mm -hmm. is probably the worst I think like in Madrid when they were like smushed together it was great because there was a lot more interaction between the the inside and the outside that would be good there any last questions? Yes, why don't you come on down to the mic? Hi, um, thank you for the session. It was really informative. Uh, my name is Glenn, uh, and I'm also from the Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences Department. Um, my question was about uh, climate financing. Um, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts about what the U.S. position was in the negotiations and like, uh, um, thank you. I'm trying to think of the one minute version of <laughs> Sorry. Climate, climate finance. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the big issues last year was uh, that the developed countries took on a, tar a goal, quote unquote, several years ago, that they would mobilize, which again, quote unquote, um, $100 billion a year by 2020. Mobilize meaning from public and private sources for the benefit of developing countries, right? For mitigation and adaptation. And they didn't quite make it in 2019, 20, 2020. So that was a major political issue last year because the you know developing countries said like you know developed countries you can't trust them <clears throat> they took on this goal they didn't meet it they failed they failed you know and um, so you know and had that that developed countries didn't like that like nomenclature of failure because the idea like if you make something almost but you don't quite make it like 
as I said, like in the U.S., you would be you'd get an A minus, you wouldn't get an F, right? <laughs> but um, so I thought like the rhetoric didn't make any sense. But it did have a catalyzing effect on developed countries. They did like the fact that they were falling short did make them scramble and come up with more money. So um, you know that was a, a big issue last year. I think the uh, the larger issue maybe coming up this year and something we're trying to concentrate on is the third objective of the Paris Agreement. So the first is this temperature goal. The second is to enhance resilience. So that's the adaptation goal. Mm -hmm. The third is to align like all financial flows with those other two objectives. Mm -hmm. That's the trillion. We keep calling that mm -hmm. the trillions, not the billions. So I guess um, you know one of the things that we are saying and others are saying we need to focus on is like, you don't keep 1.5 alive with the billions, as important as that is mm -hmm. as a political goal, right? You gotta figure out how do you get the trillions that are in the global economy to be aligned again with the other goals of the Paris Agreement. And that's like much more difficult. And so a lot, there's a lot of uh, kind of work and thinking going on on, on that score. So it's, it's a great topic for students to look into, um, yeah, so I'll stop there. It's the trillion dollar question. Yeah, trillion dollar. <laughs> exactly. Let's hope we solve it. <laughs> thanks so much, that was fascinating. Really glad to have you here. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>